Yeah, it's live when recording started. Yeah, thank you, thank you. So, uh, welcome everybody. Today, uh, it's my pleasure to be moderating this session. I'm Dr. Pallavi Prasad, Assistant Professor Nephrology at Sabdachang Hospital. And uh, today at ISOP EduConnect, we'll discuss a very interesting case uh, presentation. First of all, I would like to uh, introduce and in invite all the panelists uh, to you. Uh, the speaker today will be Dr. K.C. Gurudev. He's the Director of Nephro Urology uh, Center of Excellence at MS Ramaya Medical College and uh, the Chairperson Indian Society of Nephrology Southern Chapter. Uh, he has many credits uh, to his name and he has been the President of South Sun Iosin previously as well, received multiple awards and accolades. So he'll be uh, presenting the case today and we also have three uh, senior panelists with us to discuss this case in a more interesting way. Uh, first of all, we have Dr. Sampath Kumar, who is the Senior Consultant Nephro Nephrologist at Minakshi Mission Hospital, Madurai. He is the President-elect of uh, Asia-Pacific Society of uh, Dialysis Access, and also he is the Vice President of Avatar India. Sir has done a lot of work in PD, and uh, he was the past Secretary of PDSI. We also have Dr. Himanshu Verma with us. Uh, the head of department, Department of uh, Nephrology and Renal Transplant at BMMC and Sabdajung Hospital, New Delhi. He is a past executive member of DNS and he has uh, a lot of interest in transplantation. He has multiple national and international publications regarding the same. And of course, we have Dr. Mahesha Venkalak Kunti, Senior Consultant Nephropathologist at Manipal Hospital, Bangalore. Uh, sir has helped to develop a referral center in nephropathology at his hospital and he is an executive member of the Indian Society of Renal and Transplant Pathology. So, uh, without uh, much delay, I think uh, we'll start with the case presentation. Uh, Dr. Gurudev, will you please go ahead? Dr. Pallavi, um, let me share my... Uh, I don't know whether I call it a pleasant experience or a... Mm -hmm. Very <laughs> exciting uh, when I look back. Can you all see my slides? Hello? No. Can you see the slides? Not yet, sir. One second. Can you see the slide? Yeah. Yeah. Let me go she through can. the case very briefly. I had one uh, female patient about 42 years who had resumed uh, chronic tubular interstitial disease, was on dialysis for five years with me, one of those very loyal patients of mine who used to come very repeatedly with uh, volume overload and she was on ventilator on more than two or three occasions, came out of those crises from ICU. Sometime in 2012, she developed uh, tubercular lymphadenitis, which was treated uh, uh, adequately. She had two children, both of them were teenagers, and she didn't want to take kidney from them. And uh, husband volunteered. He coincidentally had the same blood group. Unfortunately, when I checked their uh, cross match on two occasions in May 2011 and uh, August 2011, both times it came positive for uh, donors, uh, cross match positive. So I just looked up the literature. Those days we used to use azotyphrin to desensitize, not knowing how it would work. So I just gave her azotyphrin 100 milligrams daily for six months. And uh, presently I, I was surprised to see she had turned cross match negative in uh, March. And again, I waited for some more time. And in August, again, it came as uh, negative. That's when I thought, let me check her donor-specific uh, uh, antibodies. And uh, it was reported as class 1 antibodies. I presume it was more than 1,000 MFI, though they didn't mention about it. It was done from uh, TTK lab, so it is uh, quite a reliable report. So I uh, thought we should desensitize this patient before we do any transplant. Though the literature says class 2 are more important than class 1, but when I went through the literature, even class 1 has got similar uh, 
uh, risk with when it comes to acute antibody mediated rejection so i gave you uh, rituximab 500 mg on 13th of august so followed by plasmapheresis on subsequent 3 days uh, low dose iv ig was given and i uh, wanted to cross check sent the sample to transplant immunology lab at myot hospital chennai on 18th and uh, Uh, MFA value was less than 13 for both class one and class two. Actually, class one and class two. So we scheduled the transplant on 21st of uh, August. And meanwhile, coming to the donor details, he was her husband, and he had no comorbidities. We got the, uh, all the permissions. Those days, we had to send even these people to authorization committee for permission. and we scheduled the transplant on 21st of august 2012 so this is uh, the donor angiogram this is a flush iotogram where you can see both the renal arteries uh, on flush uh, so coming to the selective renal angiogram this was the left renal artery a single vessel then the right one which was also a single vessel full nephrogram was seen so we took him for surgery a lap uh, donor nephrectomy was being done just when we were about to oh, uh, uh, cut the renal artery the clip which was used that hemolog clip it slipped from the aortic end and we had to convert the surgery into open surgery meanwhile patient had severe hypotension we had to pump in blood and saline anyway he was stabilized and kidney was taken out and given to me i i perfused it for about 15 20 minutes and took it to the recipient side this is a uh, actual the surgical what happened surgery that day uh, is a video of the surgery and we start playing One second, I don't know. It's got stuck. Sorry, one second. Something went wrong there. Are you able to see the slides? Ah, uh, yes, sir. Yeah, I can see them. Yeah. I let me. show this so this is the lap surgery being done uh, the uh, hemolog clips are being applied let me go to the other side yeah see already two clips are there this is the renal artery and the vein uh, this is when the surgeon is cutting the renal artery away from the clip this is when the disaster happened and the clip came off from the aortic side and it was flooded with the blood uh, then the surgery had to be i mean it has to be converted to open surgery then coming towards the let me switch over to the recipient what happened leave the donor there recipient was doing well she was making around 400 to 500 ml of urine Per hour on the first post-operative day, but next year morning, uh, her output started dropping. Early morning, it came down to 15 to 20 ml, and by the end of the day, she became almost annually. The Doppler showed reduced flow, peak systolic flow, and there was absolutely no end-diastolic flow at all on Doppler. So, I by the end of the day, I spoke to Dr. Mayesh and said, "I am sending one biopsy." i need very uh, report urgently so i did a biopsy around 5 uh, in the evening and sent it to bangalore same night uh, next day uh, next day morning i got uh, around 12 noon i got the report which said that uh, kidney had uh, uh, glomerular fibrin thrombi and glomerulite is suggestive of uh, antibody mediated rejection uh, C4D negative antibody mediated rejection. There was glomerulitis, there is acute tubular injury, and thrombotic microangiopathy. 
<coughs> yes. Yeah. So meanwhile, coming, uh, let me switch over to donor now. Now that recipient has developed antibody mediated rejection, he, she hardly has any output, and the donor uh, developed uh, started having hypertension. His blood pressure was 170 by 110, and he was absolutely annually. I just wanted to rule out some some obstruction. Did a ultrasound, but I tried to look at the right kidney, but I couldn't uh, get a proper window because patient was not able to hold his breath. So next day, the second post-operative day, he was still annually, creatinine had gone up to 4.7. And um, somehow I managed to do a Doppler which shows reduced blood flow. The day three, again, his creatinine jumped to 9.7. I'm talking about the donor now. His creatinine was 9.7. Hemoglobin had stabilized. There was no further bleed anywhere. And um, what I thought is this is very unusual. Some tube has blocked. Now he has got one one, heart, one real kidney and uh, I couldn't find any hydronephrosis. So I thought I should do a renal angiogram. So this is for the, when I did a flush, we couldn't trace the renal arteries, both sides, which came as a real shock to me. This is the clamp on the left renal artery, you can see. Um, then we tried to find out the right renal artery. You can just see the stump and no dye was going into the right renal artery. So it was obviously the right kidney was completely blocked. So now I have a very unusual situation. The, the recipient is aneuric because of AMR and the donor has developed severe renal failure. And uh, I couldn't find the kidney on an ang uh, angiogram. So I didn't know what to do. I just called my friend Dr. Sundar saying this is a situation. He also was wondering what to do. Then I called Dr. Balal. He also said uh, this is very unprecedented. He has never heard of this. Then I spoke to Dr. Patak, Vivek Patak in Coimbatore. I explained what he said. Why don't you take the kidney back from the uh, recipient and put it back to the donor. I couldn't even imagine doing something like that because the recipient had uh, antibody mediated rejection. I didn't know what to do. Anyhow, I thought this was the only way to prevent both of them being on dialysis. I said, okay, let's talk to the family. So family were quite, uh, just to tell, though they were very loyal patients of mine, the minute I came out of the OT and said that a donor had bleed, from that moment, he has been recording my conversation. Later on, I realized he has con recorded 400 my conversation. He had 400 CDs with him of my conversation. And uh, uh, then the Barla suggested, see, this amounts to another tra transplant. So you have to ask the authorization committee. Fortunately, in the, Everybody sitting in authorization committee and competent authority had no clue about what rejection was and what transplant or auto transplant. One of the members said, no, 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 no. yeah, it's a fantastic decision. We should take the kidney out and put it back on the donor. I just needed that word from them. Then I, with difficulty, I took the consent from the family. They were asking so many questions. How many cases has I, you have done? How many such episodes have happened in the past? Some of it great difficulty, we could get the consent. And uh, before I took the kidney from the recipient, I wanted to see how the kidney is in the uh, recipient before we opened the donor. And when I when we opened, kidney was quite turgid, enlarged. It looked so tense. I had my own doubt whether it would work when I put it back in the donor. Anyhow, it was removed and I pursued it for nearly half an hour, 20 minutes to half an hour with the cold ringer lactate. I had to make the OT attendant to stand on a stool and tie a BP cuff to the ringer lactate uh, solution to forcibly uh, flush the kidney. Then we too, I took the uh, kidney to the donor side. The bed was prepared on the right eye left fossa. It was transplanted and uh, it, uh, I was happy to see it became pink immediately. 
but there was no urine output for almost one and a half hours. I didn't let the surgeons close because I was worried whether if something uh, it, it gets um, it becomes blue or something. No point in leaving such a kidney there, and it would trigger off DAC or something. Fortunately, it was well perfused. The arteries were pulsating, and at the end of one and a half to hours to nearly two hours, I could see some urine trickling from the ureter. Then I asked the surgeons to do the ureteric anastomosis. Something told me, let me take a biopsy of this kidney. What is its state now that? Uh, by the time they were uh, completing the ureteric anastomosis, the urine was flowing very freely. Then I took a biopsy and I was happy when I took a biopsy because the, the spurt of blood that came out from the surface of the kidney was quite reassuring, suggesting that there has been good perfusion of the kidney. So the autotransplant was done. By the time he was wheeled out of the OT, already there was 600 ml of urine in the bag. So progressively his creatinine dropped. But my nightmare didn't end there. On day five, the donor developed a status epilepticus and no drug could stop his uh, seizure and we had to paralyze him, put him on ventilator. That was because his BP had shot up very high. And But he had made around 2.5 liters of urine. BP, creatinine had dropped to 2.3. Day six, he was uh, extubated. He was ori oriented. When I was talking to him, he was looking somewhere else. I asked him, why are you looking to the opposite direction? Then he said, I am blind. I'm not able to see anyone. We did a CT brain and found that he had bilateral diffuse cortical infarcts, which was diagnosed as stress syndrome. And uh, did a Doppler of the transplanted kidney, auto-transplant kidney, which showed absolutely normal flow. So day eight, patient was conscious oriented. We had was 2.8 and he started walking and he said he's able to see now. Some haziness was there, but by the end of the day, he was able to see completely. So just when I was breathing easily, the patient started developing breathlessness. So I did an x-ray, it showed massive effusion on the left side of the chest. Aspirated one liter under ultrasound guidance, patient became comfortable. By then creatinine was 1.7. Day 19 to 22 was the most miserable time of, uh, for the patient and for me because patient developed uh, severe breathlessness, had to be intubated. X-ray showed bilateral massive pleural effusions. So I decided to, we decided to put a bilateral intercostal drainage and albumin was very low. We had to give him many bottles of albumin and he was on ventilator for four days and uh, uh, he was weaned off later on and ICD we removed on day 27. Patient got discharged on 37th post-operative day with creatinine of 1 and with uh, antihypertensives. He had normal vision, no neurological deficit. He was walking around. We discharged same night. I got a call that he has come back to hospital with severe breathlessness. His hemoglobin was around 7. He had severe pulmonary edema. Fortunately, um, he settled with IV diuretics and I transfused two units of blood and after two days he discharged him. Recipient was meanwhile discharged on fifth post-operative day and she was on regular hemodialysis. I had taken off all the immunosuppressions. And by then I had forgotten about uh, what had happened to the biopsy I had sent. That's when Mahesh reminded me and sent this biopsy to me where he said, sir, all the changes have disappeared. And kidney is looking almost glomerular, looking absolutely normal. But for mild tubular injury, glomerular looked absolutely normal and there was no my thrombotic microangiopathy visible. So that was evidenced by his normal kidney function. And after one and a half years, I did the isotope renogram, which showed a very good functioning kidney and the right iliac fossa. And I was surprised to see some traces in the native kidney on the right side. And the report said normal functioning transplanted kidney, no evidence of any cortical scars and normal size right kidney with very poor function. Looking back, I thought when the surgeon, when he bled, the surgeon applied a lot of pressure on the iota through the small window. That's he was already 50, in his uh, early 50s. He must have had some uh, 
uh, blocks in the aorta which might have got dislodged and uh, blocked the other uh, kidney and by the time we recognized i don't uh, I, i didn't think it was advisable to open because when we tried to do angioplasty while doing the angiogram we couldn't uh, the cardiology interventional cardiologist couldn't go anywhere close to the renal artery the the hurdles were the family was asking too many questions references success rate how many such cases have happened fortunately in 2012 itself nigm had uh, published a case report of reversal of fsgs from a live related donor uh, transplant which they removed and put it in some other uh, donor uh, recipient where the fsgs biopsy grown fsgs in the graft had disappeared i show i could show only one such uh, case report to them and there was extensive media coverage in the television and the papers implicating doctors negligence and a case was filed in the police station with criminal negligence and a case was filed in karnataka medical council for medical negligence and there was complaint lodged in government of karnataka and an inquiry was initiated against us and complaint lodged at state and central human rights commission and the hospital had to take uh, police protection because of the very hostile behavior of the family and relatives who were very loyal to me for almost 5 years they had cashless transactions in another hospital but they they wanted to have a transplant only under my care i think i was just trying to go through this so the questions that i raised were the hemolop clips that are used comes with a black box warning saying that uh, it should not be used for live donor nephrectomy then we did a survey of, uh, we sent a letter to all the transplant centers in the country all surgeons said they are still using hemolop clips for the lab donor nephrectomy and they are still using them and we had to take permission from i, I just wrote an email to the authorization committee since the time was too short does it amount to another transplant should we take permission from them then comes the medical legal implication what if all the patients start asking now you have made a diagnosis of rejection why don't you put it back in the donor so these are the questions that uh, are raised by me to myself i don't know the answers for most of them so this is what i published in uh, ajkd as a correspondence uh, how it all happened then i went to the literature there are only four case reports one is uh, successful use of transplanted kidney this was a patient who had received a, a the cadaveric kidney later on he himself developed uh, uh, intracerebral bleed and brain dead and that kidney was taken out and transplanted to some other recipient which worked well similarly i just told you about the fsgs recurrence in the graft which got resolved completely published in nagm in 2012 then in again ajkd has published about a thrombotic microangiopathy recurrence in a recipient the kidney was taken out and put in another recipient where it worked very well and there was complete reversal of tma in the recipient so this is the this is my story uh, uh thank you very much uh, dr gurudev i think quite an enthralling presentation and i'm sure uh, you brought goosebumps to each one of us present in this presentation as well and uh, but uh, yes, i lost i lost 10 years of my age i aged by 10 years and lost half of my hair in 35 days <laughs> so it was quite a i should uh, thank uh, the hospital which stood by me and uh, my family which was with me yes definitely sir i can understand it must have been a very stressful period but i think uh, kudos to you that you changed this adversity into opportunity and you could still uh, salvage the, the kidney and implant it in, into the donor despite all the hurdles um is it still on dialysis now uh, actually she has been on dialysis for now 18 years and the donors i i came to know through my colleague his creatinine is around 1.5 or something 
he is doing well this is after 13 14 13 years of uh, this surgery that happened right. okay now it's open for discussion yes sir i would like the panelists to give their uh, comments on this dr sampat kumar sir would you like to start like your comments on the topic and anything you would like to point out no when i heard uh, am i audible yes sir you are audible yeah when uh, my guru uh, recounted the story to me 10 years ago uh, it was quite a remarkable uh, how did he act that he had performed because uh, i don't think um, many would have dare to go back and then discuss with the family and explain the kidney and implant it again onto their donor so it was a remarkable turn around uh, for the benefit of the donor and so i thought during a recent discussion last month that this story should have a wider audience and that was uh, possibly the spark which ignited this uh, discussion and about the hemo hemolock uh, gurudev uh, you are right that uh, even today uh, all the surgeons are using only that so uh, as i was seeing the video clip is it possible that uh, the the clips were not applied properly before uh, the um, scissors were applied what happened is he had already applied two clips uh, but was it uh, properly locked it yeah was it was locked there um, it some suspicion the that the second yeah, clip was not pro properly no, 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 not locked yeah. i had the similar suspicion i was in the ot i told the, because we can hear the clicking of the yeah. clips yeah. i told the surgeon i didn't hear the click uh, properly he said exactly the same what he said gurudev i will put one more clip for your satisfaction so in fact that clipping 1.25 minutes which is there there are three clips applied okay so he applied one more clip because i said i didn't hear the clicking noise so mm -hmm. obviously when uh, i i got a feeling that one clip has overridden the other clip mm -hmm. so that caused uh, suddenly when the artery was cut all the three opened up uh dr sampath you were saying uh, there are like most surgeons are they are still using the yeah. hemolock clips so i yeah. think maybe we should use this forum to bring this awareness among surgeons because i think now in the kedigo guidelines also they specifically mention that we should not be using this and i think we should convey this to our surgeons definitely because yeah, i understand but i think uh, the metallic clips are not uh, available if i am not uh, wrong because they are saying that uh, the uh, only hemolock clips are available here i am stand I, i stand to correction but i would like to have some surgeon who is listening to this to respond to my this thing people hospital has published a paper of 189 donors lap donor nephrectomy using they specifically mentioned they used hemolock clips yes yes so we would request any surgeon who's there in the audience you can mm -hmm. please leave us a mail or put it in the question answer box and i think uh, uh, we would know better if uh, staples or such uh, metallic uh, clips are available for the use of the same uh, next i would like to invite dr himanshu verma sir uh, please can you share your comments or your opinion regarding the case uh, i would like to thanks sir for uh, enlightening us uh... regarding this uh, unusual uh, i think uh, uh, incident or case that happened uh, many years ago and uh, this was a pure surgical uh, complication was there in the trachea and uh, the courage with which uh, sir dealt with the patient family and uh, donor is uh, commendable and because uh, when we come across such uh, situations in a renal transplant mainly in the live means live living donor in a transplant uh, then uh, we need some we need to keep cool and uh, we need to uh, explore all the options that we can have and i think uh, 
this case uh, will give us a lot of confidence to the juniors like us uh, uh, that we should always keep cool and uh, keep on uh, uh, troubleshooting what best we can do. And this is a sure, this is a good example. This is an excellent example of, uh, and just like I, I mean to say, sir behaved like a captain cool, MS Dhoni, just like that in difficult situations that he, he used to do. And uh, as far as uh, that uh, clip is concerned, Sir, is it possible that the donor may be having some type of thrombogenicity that he developed that uh, thrombosis? It investigate extensively. I did all tests, including uh, protein C and all estimations, protein S, protein C estimation. We could not find any hypercoagulable state in him. You know, I my still my guess is. Because in, the, in that panicky situation, surgeon applied severe pressure on the uh, iota. Uh, uh, he might have dislodged like cholesterol, I mean, plaque, some athero atherosclerotic plaque or something into the opposite. Sir? Yeah. Yes? Okay. I can hear some other noise. Guru, I also feel that uh, the severe hypertension that he had postoperatively, the donor was also linked to the ischemia of the kidney. And uh, very likely that it was uh, renin and angiotensin were pouring out from that ischemic kidney that was producing all that. Absolutely right. That's what I could correlate. And yes. the most traumatizing was when he developed uh, blindness. Uh, yeah. He became completely blind for almost three days and uh, I was wondering, now I have a, this donor, I brought him out of this uh, key landing up in uh, permanent dialysis. Now, am I going to leave him blind for the rest of the life? That was very, very yeah. uh, disturbing to me. But fortunately, God's grace, that's why I keep telling a lot of good souls are around me. Uh, and uh, I think they were all praying for me. And uh, he just, third, fourth day, he just said he's able to recognize me. He was a very gentle man. He was uh, very, but he was constantly telling his children and not to escalate this. But uh, family was hell bent on taking it all for me. It appeared on Hyderabad Times. It came on Ahmedabad uh, Times. It came on front page of Bombay Times. Where uh, stories suggesting that uh, husband wanted to save the life of the wife and he himself became a victim, something like that. But people didn't, uh, the press did not appreciate. Though, in one of the TV shows, one of my colleagues uh, was called to give opinion. He defended me, saying that that was the best one could have done. Yeah. Yes, definitely, yes. sir. I think, sir, has rightly said, Captain Cool. I think a lot of us would not have had the courage to do that. Um, no, I still feel in a transplant program, I keep telling my youngsters, we should keep calm. See, a cardiac surgeon, when he does a surgery, he doesn't panic like us. Because we are, uh, we nephrologists, as our, our, we are very sensitive about the functioning of the kidney of the transplant being always successful. But uh, we have to keep cool. We have to, at the upfront, we have to tell the patient and the family. If someone asks me, all your transplants are successful, I say, absolutely no. I lost kidneys on the first day of uh, transplant. If I say my transplant program is excellent, uh, I keep telling, I am telling the biggest lie. So that makes us feel comfortable, not feel guilty. And uh, we have to keep cool. We should not show that we are also panicked. You know, that's what I keep telling the youngsters, my postgraduates. Transplant is like a marriage. We bring two unknown people to live happily forever. It doesn't happen like that. So I, while counseling also, I give exactly the... Uh, about a marriage. It's marrying between, marriage between the donor kidney and the recipient. 
many a times the marriages break on the first day same thing happen in transplant also but most of the people are living happily after marriage though they are divorces i compare it to minor uh, tussles i compare it to acute rejections which gets corrected by mutual talking and intervention from the elderly repeated acute rejection leads to even giving up by the parents and chronic rejection is when the divorce happens so i compare transplant to a marriage all the time and patients get convinced about the outcome very interesting thing yeah. uh dr mahesh sir would you would you want to talk something mahesh would like mahesh should be telling us more about the he is the one who gave a lot of hope to me you know his report made me to take the kidney out of the recipient mahesh yeah so this story is something like uh, listening to one of the rare situations and uh, as you all mentioned the captain cool it's difficult to uh, digest when an unexpected thing happens on the ot like one kidney you are not able to see the right kidney and few days later the vision is gone and uh, with such a kind of emotional to keep uh, thinking about what best can be done uh, in in the interest of patient so that's a, a hats off uh, uh, to dr gurudev sir um like coming to the first biopsy which uh, had the features of uh, uh, both the uh, thrombotic microangiopathy in the gloms uh, most of the gloms had uh, fibrin thrombi and also with the evidence of glomerulitis the c4d stain had shown one plus uh, positivity like less than 10% of the ptc is being positive for c4d so this was uh the decision to call it as like in in the con uh glomerulitis along with the c4d uh though the tma could have been for any other reason like iatrogenic uh and this was a perfect setting for uh, having that kind of a scenario uh but the c4d was positive so that uh, was a, a convincing to uh, call it as a acute uh, antibody mediated rejection um uh, uh that's about the first biopsy and uh, coming to the later second uh, uh the biopsy which was done after the auto transplant uh, procedure uh, that had uh, completely uh, uh, kind of vanished all the fibrin within the gloms it's it was kind of a flushing out all the capillaries and uh, uh, making them uh, patent all throughout uh, only finding was that of a moderate degree of uh, acute tubular injury uh, and the c4d was negative and i i called up sir to say that uh, this is kind of a dramatic recovery in a span of 5 days with a florid amr looking at uh, the second one uh, i i have never seen this kind of a uh, resolution of histologic features uh, and, and uh, that's about this uh, patients both the biopsies um so, yeah dr mahesh if i may ask like do you really expect that within hours there can be such dramatic histological changes or do you think that because rejections are also like patchy processes so maybe the second biopsy definitely there would have been recovery but can it really occur like on the biopsy was an on table biopsy is it really feasible no the uh, uh, the patchy process i agree that it could be a, a very uh, patchy involvement of uh, fibrin thrombi uh, but this uh, this kind of uh, uh uh the second biopsy without an, having any fibrin thrombi i i would uh, look at it in a different way that the uh, as it is in a different milieu altogether uh, the autograft has uh, done its action uh, in in quicker times right it could be it's possible i suppose because when we go through the 
other auto trans I mean transplants that have done from one recipient to others where the FSGS dramatically the protein has stopped uh, immediately. The way it starts immediately in malignant FSGS and it has stopped immediately. So there are certain circulating factors which are constantly bombarding the transplanted kidney. When that bombardment stops, I think uh, there is a possibility when it gets into a normal internal milieu, I think there is a possibility. I don't need speculations, that's all. Uh, but I have the evidence now that. Uh, and when, you, when I looked at the kidney that day, I never thought this kidney would work because it was like a, the consistency was like a tennis ball. I have held hundreds and hundreds of kidneys from the donor before I have given it to the recipient side table. But they are so supple and uh, his kidney was, even after perfusion, it was turgid. Like uh, if I had uh, bounced it, it would have, I mean, if I had thrown it on the floor, it would have bounced it. It would have bounced. Uh, so I knew there was a lot of edema in that. A lot of infiltration must have been happening there. Then it just happened like that. I think there are some questions being asked there. Uh, yes, sir. So we'll take the questions from the audience. Uh, there's one question uh, which asks what were the implications and verdict of criminal and medical negligence cases in this case? So what if happened is. Uh, happy to share it uh, and comfortable. Uh, yeah, what happened case. is, uh, uh, I said that's why I thanked the. Uh, thanked, uh, my administ hospital administration, they got into the negotiation table, multiple negotiations happened. I think they settled it for something and they withdrew all the cases. But the government inquiry went on. We all had to appear in front of the inquiry committee. Uh, one of them was a non clinician who held on to this uh, uh, hemolog clip, FDA. Uh, black box warning, but then we had to produce the uh, literature and uh, the response from all the transplant centers who are doing lab donor nephrectomy. They all still used and are still using hemolocly. So there were few uh, nephrologists and urologists who were active in transplant they all gave a favorable opinion saying that it was not an intentional negligence as such. There was no intention for the party to, for us to cause harm to the patient. Then the police case was also withdrawn and they withdrew the case from the medical council. They were very, very loyal patients of mine. They were wonderful family. They didn't want to go anywhere uh, other than me for the transplant. Because they were, at least on three occasions, she was brought to casualty in almost uh, respect arrest. She was intubated timely, brought her out of pulmonary edema, dialysis and ventilation. So I think somewhere in their mind, it was still there that I had done some good to them. So they withdrew all the cases and the government also gave a uh, inquiry report also came out in our favor. That's what, uh, otherwise it would have prolonged for another 12 years. Any case going to Karnataka Medical Council will not find the end of the story for minimum 10 to 15 years. So, that's it. Uh, so, we have another question, uh, actually two questions almost, which are asking the same thing that uh, despite a CDC and DSA negative post desensitization, how do we explain the ABMR and how do we explain the rapid uh, reversal? I think we've already discussed about the reversal, but uh, I, I think it's time that we discuss regarding the decision for going ahead with the CDC cross match positive. And secondly, despite the CDC and DSA being Plum negative, why Why exactly should an AMR have happened in this case? I think those who are in active transplant program, we know that most of the cases we do are not even historically positive cases. Right, right. They are negative and they are DSA negative, but still we do come across antibody-mediated rejection. Uh, 
not uh, it's not uncommon it's quite common now of late or even earlier it was there so it's not in uh, unheard of uh, situation sampath should be able to uh, highlight on that abmr acute abmr is not uncommon that way yeah we so do have issue. so we do now that we are uh, looking more closely at uh, non hla antibodies also so these are all things which uh, come up rarely so like uh, the angiotensin 2 receptor antibodies they are all now being recognized and it was not uh, no common knowledge at that time so years ago yeah even like yeah, the uh, anti endothelial antibodies yeah yeah, yeah. So, mahesh is the one uh -huh. who reports almost all our biopsies in karnataka he should be able to highlight yeah How often so, uh, if we look at the incidence of amr versus uh, the acr in the early transplants now the things have changed like it the acr is almost uh, unheard of in the initial period so all that we are uh, more concerned or more um, findings that we see is that of uh, microvascular injury and if there is any uh, aggressive nature so the tma also will be one of the finding so microvascular injury is all that uh, in the early transplants that we focus on as of the current trend uh, so amr is always at uh, a risk uh, that we have to see uh, in in the early period right sir uh, doctor patient i had sent uh, the, uh, when the amr diagnosis happened i sent the blood again for donor specific antibodies in the recipient and then all this was happening i lost track of that sample which was sent to chennai later on when things sort of settled down when i inquired unfortunately the courier fellow had uh, given it to the blood bank instead of transplant immunology then they didn't know what to do with it and they had discarded the sample that would have given us some idea i also didn't pursue because there was a lot of uh, commotion going on mentally emotionally sort of things were happening it was like a war zone the hospital was like a war zone definitely definitely sir uh, dr himanshu uh, sir i would like to ask you one question which has been discussed actually before that uh, do you personally have any any uh, threshold for desensitization like at what mfi do you actually prefer to desensitize patients and go ahead or do you rather uh, prefer an alternate donor or a swap in such cases yeah actually the same thing as uh, sir has highlighted this case so uh, things can happen matlab whatever is written in the literature that can happen this case showed the same thing and uh, as far as i think uh, live related transplants they are more risky transplants as compared to the disease donor transplants because there you have a cadaver kidney so if the dsa is positive i think even if you desensitize there is a higher chances that uh, the antibody is returned back because the memory b cells are there but uh, as far as mfi is concerned if the flow cross match is positive cdc is negative then we need to des if the mfi means if you do dsa in uh, now there is higher resolution hla so you can just pinpoint which antibodies are uh, in the significantly higher so i think with below 1000 uh, there is no need to dense desensitize if the cd is negative but up to 5000 i think we can desensitize the patients and we can go ahead with the transplants with uh, atg as induction isn't right right i'm sure everybody has their own threshold but um, uh, i think it varies from center to center there was uh, one more topic which we wanted to discuss with dr mahesha which was regarding uh, dr gurudev had mentioned regarding two other cases of fsgs and tma which were retransplanted into different recipients and and resolved completely so sir are there any any other such uh opportunities which we have apart from fsgs and tma where the internal milieu is the reason for uh the the disease and we can consider 
retransplanting into a do the case where we are retransplanting into a donor is of course going to be very very rare yeah uh, uh, like uh, if the there will be scenarios where uh, in the deceased act, uh, especially the deceased donor if there are uh, instances like the urine protein is positive uh, in a say for example diabetic patients or if there is any uh, hematuria in the uh, icu patient who is to be declared brain dead and a possible uh, uh, donor uh, so in in those instances when we do the do get the biopsies of for uh, uh, evaluation of the histology per se uh, to see if there is any diabetic lesions or if there is any uh, iga in the deceased donor so uh, uh, if the renal function is normal or if the histology per, uh, as uh, especially the tubular interstitial compartment and the glomerular chronicity is not at all present in the biopsy uh, if there is just subtle e expansion of the mesenchymal matrix and you do the immunofluorescence on uh, on priority uh, we have ample amount of time when uh, uh, in the disease donors uh, scenario uh, so the immunofluorescence would take almost uh, one and a half to two hours so that is permissible in that uh, tr transition of uh, uh, procedure so even if we get a, a diagnosis of IgA nephropathy, so that should not be a, 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 a reason for rejecting the uh, 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 kidney. Uh, similarly, in diabetic patients, if there is no chronicity and if there is uh, only uh, 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 mesangial expansion uh, uh, with a proven uh, record of uh, blood sugar being elevated in the disease uh, track record. So th that those kidneys should not be uh, rejected. Uh, even the literature says that the KW lesion, lesions can be reversed in a uh, recipient because uh, it's the milieu that is more important rather than what disease uh, it has in a subtle uh, phase. So uh, IgA and uh, diabetic, I would say these two are other scenarios when it comes to uh, accepting the uh, kidneys from the deceased donor. Like uh, in the live donations uh, of family or the uh, donors who are uh, subsequent in the recipients, we do get an indicated biopsy. And if the in the immunofluorescence, we, sometimes we get the mesangial IgA deposits. So that, that's nowhere... Are related to the recipient disease, even if uh, 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 done in the early uh, period. So that's all derived from the donor. So uh, in the subsequent biopsies, for IgA, at least I have a couple of patients who have uh, been uh, done as I indicated subsequently, but the IgA deposits has vanished in the uh, uh, further uh, biopsies. So that means that the milieu is more important rather than the uh, disease in a subtle phase in the uh, donor uh, graft. So these two are the other scenarios where uh, uh, the milieu, uh, milieu is uh, important. Uh, thank you very much sir, for telling us uh, regarding that because uh, I think it's very, very important. important. It's a very important uh, point Mahesh has brought about. Because, uh, see, many, many patients uh, who are, uh, we find HbA1c of 6, but they don't have 6.2 or 6.5. They are never uh, found to be diabetic till then. Only when we are evaluating as donors, we find that. Actually, if we had done a biopsy on these donors, we would have definitely found some mesangial expansion or some deposit. Clinically, the disease may not be evident at that point. And as Mahesha said, there has been a case report way back in the 90s in Kuwait when they did a transplant from a diabetic uh, disease donor. Biopsy proven KW lesions <laughs> had completely disappeared uh, in the recipient after some time. So uh, uh, I have two such cases of diabetic lesions with the KW in the pre-transplant uh, pre evaluation. Uh, Dr. Anil uh, uh, from BGS Hospital 
uh, is a nephrologist. So uh, he, he uh, I have convinced and we discussed a lot about this uh, case report that Sir had mentioned just now. And he has done the protocol biopsies uh, uh, on, on a curiosity basis, convincing the patient to get the biopsy procedure done. So there is no further... Uh, progression of disease in the subsequent protocol biopsies. So the, uh, in, in the, uh, uh, the KW lesion, which was there in the pre-transplant, has been in the first uh, protocol biopsy. But in the second, I could not find the KW, but there is definitely the expansion of the mesangial matrix is still there. So, and the chronicity is never uh, an issue in the subsequent biopsy. So that uh, adds on to the point that the progression of the diabetes is not happening in the recipient. Right. So we'll take one last question, which is which is a very interesting question, is that uh, considering the possibility of passenger lymphocyte syndrome and considering that uh, donor lymphocytes were definitely present in the explanted kidney, was any immunosuppression given to the donor? And uh, do you think these lymphocytes could cause uh, any problem when ex retransplanted in the donor? I think yeah, it is a highly theoretical possibility because the life of the passenger leukocyte is going to be very short and if at all uh, major graft versus host disease to happen, you require uh, long-standing um, generation Production. of these lymphocytes. It's going to be a transient affair. Right, right, sir. I think uh, we've already exceeded our time and we should uh, close this excellent session. Uh, thank you very much, uh, first of all, Dr. Gurudev for sharing this excellent case with us, which has been a learning case for each one of us present here. Uh, Dr. Sampath Kumar, Dr. Mahesha and Dr. Himanshu for your excellent insights and uh, to all the audience for their involvement and uh, their questions for this uh, session and I'll also I would like to thank Dr. Manish Balwani and Dr. Arpita for uh, starting this uh, excellent initiative for the education of uh, transplant physicians and surgeons. Uh, with that I would like to end the session. Uh, thank you very much everybody and hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.